Hi friends, you want to hear an amazing fact. China has the most sophisticated facial recognition software in the world. Using just their faces, the people can buy their groceries, withdraw cash, check in at the airport. In fact, China has over 200 million cameras scattered around the country watching its citizens with plans of putting up 400 million cameras. Soon, with supercomputers, they're going to have the technology to monitor all of their citizens, follow their finances, and even check their emotions. Sounds like science fiction, but it's happening now. We're going to talk more about the mark of the beast tonight. Stay with us in this presentation of Revelation Now. <laughs> Good evening, friends. We'd like to welcome you all once again to Revelation Now, coming to you live from the Amazing Facts studio in uh, Granite Bay, California. We'd like to welcome those joining us across the country and around the world. We've been going through some of the most important prophecies of the Bible, and tonight is no exception. A very important prophecy talking about the mark of the beast. So we are glad you are tuning in for this. We'd like to remind you that we do have live Spanish translation at the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook page and also the YouTube channel as well as the Revelation Now Spanish website and then also sign language for the deaf that's also available at the Revelation Now website. Don't forget at the end of the presentation this evening we'll be taking your Bible questions. Always fun to look forward to seeing what questions come in. So you probably will have several questions at the end of this presentation so feel free to type it there on Facebook in the comment section and Pastor Doug will try to answer as many of those questions as possible as time will allow. We'd like to greet our viewers who are watching from uh, some of the countries that we haven't recognized yet. We got uh, some communication from Saudi Arabia, folks who are watching there, Angola, Solomon Islands, and Egypt. So we'd like to welcome all of those who are watching from those countries. Uh, Alexander in Serbia says, we are streaming these programs in our own language on Facebook and YouTube and we are very blessed. So greetings to Alexander and those in Serbia. We have Gravis who is watching from the Solomon Islands and he says we are tuning into all of your Revelation meetings Pastor Doug and God, God bless you. And then Susan from Queensland, Australia. She says I have enjoyed these programs and have learned so much. Thank you. And then finally we got Cody who is uh, watching from Belize and uh, there they say three to four families are meeting regularly to hear these presentations. We are so encouraged. And you can see the little group meeting there in Belize. They gather together faithfully and they participating in the Revelation Now series. So greetings to all of those who are joining us across the country, whether you're by yourself watching in front of your computer or on your television screen, or if you gathered with a group or your family, a very warm welcome to all of you. We'd like to remind you that we do have a lesson that goes along with the presentation tonight. You'll find this on the Revelation Now website. It's entitled Mark for Death. It's got the same title as today's presentation. And then we also have a free gift. It's one of the Amazing Facts study guides. And it's simply entitled The Mark of the Beast. And if you'd like to receive a digital copy of this study guide, text the word marked to the number 40544 and you'll get a digital copy of that study guide. If you're outside of North America, just go to the Revelation Now website and you'll be able to download that study guide under the section that says resources. Well, we have a very important program tonight and we want to give Pastor Doug as much time as we can, so I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to please come forward. Good evening, Pastor Ross. Good evening, Pastor Doug, and as we said, uh, an important program tonight so yes. those who are watching want to encourage you grab your Bibles there's a lot of Bible verses so mm -hmm. take advantage of that let's start with prayer dear Lord once again we are thankful that we're able to open up your word and study these very important um, relevant time prophecies relating to our time and so we pray for your special blessing be with those who are watching and we pray for Pastor Doug as he opens the word in Jesus name amen amen thank you Pastor Ross and don't forget in just a few minutes, we're going to be meeting again with Pastor Ross and dealing with your Bible questions. And we anticipate, hope, that you're going to have plenty of questions on tonight's subject, dealing with the subject of the mark of the beast. And, you know, as always, we like to kind of go out on the street and find out what some of the uh, citizens have to say. We took our camera crews to several major cities in North America 
just grabbed people on the street and started asking them Bible questions. And this time we asked them what they thought or knew about the mark of the beast. So here you have it. The mark of the beast. I've never even heard of that. I've never heard of Mark of the Beast. So I have to be honest and say I'm not sure what the Mark of the Beast really represents. It's something that will mark you as uh, a person who belongs to this world. You will not be able to buy or sell or trade or do anything without it. There will be a requirement that everybody have this Mark of the Beast. And if they don't, they will not be able to uh, buy things. It was supposed to be some futuristic thing like this chip that we're supposed to all get soon. I was told, uh, growing up, I was told that that is going to happen and that's going to be the mark of the beast. And if you get that, then you're definitely going to hell. I've heard that it's tattoos. I've heard that it's, uh, you know, a 666 somewhere on your body. I've heard that it's a freckle or a mole, I've, you know. One of the marks of the beast is like the three sixes, which is 666. The devil's numbers. So <laughs> I actually refrain from saying <laughs> 666. Every time I see them, I look away. 666 for me has to do like with the devil and hell. Uh, obviously, easy one here. I think that just means evil, devil, anything surrounding that. It's the devil's number. Um, everything bad. So usually when there's like a you know horror movie, 666 is involved or you know a pentagram and other stuff. All right, there you have it, friends. Everything from never heard of it before to some very concise and intuitive responses. We're gonna to go to the Bible and find out what the Word of God has to say. Now, in part one of this presentation this morning, we read to you from Revelation chapter 13 up until verse 10. We're gonna pick it up now with verse 11. We've described and identified that first beast in Revelation chapter 13, but then it tells us about another beast. So there are really two beasts when we're talking about the mark of the beast. It's really a confederacy of these two beasts working together. Verse 11, Revelation 13. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. Hmm, lamb's a good thing. But he spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And caused the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted to give power and to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand or on the foreheads, and that none might buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six, or 666. Six, six. All right. With that uh, little backdrop, we're going to go into our study. Remember, we always need to use the Bible stories to understand these Bible teachings. We're going to go back to the beginning. And in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, it tells us Adam and Eve initially had two sons. Later, they had many sons and daughters. You can read about that in Genesis 5. But it tracks the genealogy through the first two sons, and their names were Cain and Abel. But it tells us they're very different. Like Jacob and Esau were different, Cain and Abel were different. Uh, Cain, he loved to work with the soil, he liked to uh, farm, but Abel was a keeper of sheep. And it tells us that he seemed to have a little more of a tender uh, sympathy than Cain. But uh, in the process of time, they both brought offerings to the Lord. Now the Lord had set up the sacrificial system. When Adam and Eve left the garden, you remember they tried to cover their nakedness with fig leaves, and God said that will not do. And he gave them robes of skin. And obviously something had to die to cover their nakedness. And this is when the Lord established the sacrificial system. Revelation talks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So they knew that whenever they offered a lamb, it symbolized the day when God's son, the lamb of God, Jesus, would come and die for our sins and the sins of the world. So as painful as that was, Abel obeyed. And it says that he brought the firstling of his flock and he laid it on the altar. And Cain, 
he decided that was maybe a messy business. He said, well, you're a shepherd, so you bring your sheep, but I'm a farmer, I'm going to bring some fruit. So they both built altars, and they both made an offering to God, and Abel said, you really ought to do what God told us to do. Cain said, well, it doesn't matter. And fire came down from God and accepted the offering of Abel, but nothing happened to the offering of fruit or vegetables that Cain had, except fruit flies. And Cain became angry with his brother. And the Bible tells us that they must have had some serious discussions. He resented it. Abel tried to remonstrate with him and say, you know, we really, you should obey God. God even said to Cain, sin lies at your door. But he hardened his heart. And finally, at one point, they were discussing these issues. And you read in Genesis 4, verse 8, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him, killed his brother. And then God said to Cain, the voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So right here in the beginning, you notice true worship, false worship. God's way of worshiping, man's way of worshiping, man-made worship. The one who is worshiping wrong persecutes the one who is worshiping right and finally kills him as a death decree and then he gets a mark. So with that background, you can see echoes of that all the way back in the book of Revelation in the end of the Bible. And uh, that should probably set the stage for us to go to our first question. And we've got several questions, got a lot of material, and uh, you pray for me as I preach, and uh, I'll try and be as clear as I can with what can be a simple subject, but there's a lot to, uh, lot to take in. All right, first question. Who will be protected through the seven last plagues? Now, we don't have a specific lesson that talks about Revelation 15 and 16 and the seven last plagues, but the uh, Bible tells us there is a time of trouble coming in the future, unlike anything that has ever happened. Jesus says this in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark chapter 13, and Daniel chapter 12, talks about a great time of trouble. And, but God's people are protected through these plagues, just like God protected his people through the plagues that fell on the Egyptians. It says in Revelation chapter 7, and matter of fact, I'd like to open that and read it to you from the Bible. If you have your Bibles, you can join me. Go to Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. That's simply, they didn't think the earth was square. That meant the four directions, north, south, east, west. Holding the four winds of the earth, that the winds should not blow. These are the winds of tribulation and trial. The winds should not blow on the earth or the sea or any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth. See, they're holding back this tribulation. That's the harm of the earth. Saying, do not harm the earth, the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God in the foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. We'll talk more about who they are a little later. So there's this group that is protected, and it says, seal them. And a seal is placed in the forehead, and right away people are thinking, whoa, seal in the forehead, that's the bad guys. No, the Bible is telling us that the seal in the forehead is actually going to be dealing with the ones who are saved. And so uh, you can read here in Revelation 7, verse 3, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And so there's a group that is supposed to be having the seal of God in their foreheads, and they're the ones that are saved. Let me read something to you from Ezekiel chapter 9. And everyone automatically thinks the ones who are sealed are the ones who are going to be suffering. Look at this. Go to Ezekiel 9. It describes the six destroying angels that are going to go through the land of Israel. And in 9 verse 3, it says, Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where it had been uh, to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man who was clothed with linen, who had a writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of all the men who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done in it. To the others he said in my hearing, 
Go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eye spare or have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men and maidens and little children and women. But do not come near anybody upon whom is the mark. So here this is group in Ezekiel and it's going to get a mark. And uh, the ones who are marked are actually the ones who are saved. Oh, you want to, they're trying to give me signals here, friends. I, I, I can't concentrate when the director's giving me signals. He's, my microphone's too close. Pull it slightly off my cheek. It's bumping. All right, I'm glad he's telling me that. They're, they're using pantomime. I'm going, I don't know what that is. All right, back to our study. Now I can figure out what's going on. So we just read here in Ezekiel that it's telling us that there's a group that's marked, but they're the good guys. They're saved. Everyone automatically thinks if there's a mark, that means, oh, don't, don't want to get the mark in the last days, but everybody's going to be marked in Revelation. You will either have the seal of God in the last days or you have the mark of the beast. So, back to our study. So we want the good seal. What is the seal that the righteous have in their foreheads? You can read the answer in uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. It's telling us that the disciples of the Lord have the seal. Seal the law. So there's something in the law that contains a seal. Also, let's find out what is a seal. It tells us that God's seal contains three things. And I, what I did is I put a seal up here on the screen. I just captured this off the internet. It's the seal of um, British Columbia, and they're under um, the British Empire, of course, and it says Elizabeth II, by the way, the longest reigning monarch in England's history, Elizabeth II, Queen, Canada. All seals contain three components. It'll have the territory, it'll have the name, and it will have the title. And uh, you have several seals in the Bible. There was a seal that was placed on the tomb of Jesus by Pontius Pilate. It said Pontius Pilate, governor, Judea. There was a seal that was placed on the lion's den when Daniel was dropped in there. And it said Darius, king, Medo-Persia. And so all seals will contain those three components. So where it says bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Where do we find the seal of God in the law of God? You know, you can look here. Actually, I've got it on the screen. Which of the Ten Commandments contains all of the elements or components that you would find in a seal? For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, there you have it. The Lord, that's his name, Jehovah, made. He's the creator and the sustainer. The heavens and the earth, the whole cosmos, the universe. His name his title, his territory is in the middle of God's law. Now, before we go any farther, I, I can try and anticipate some of what uh, some of you may be thinking out there. Isn't the seal of God the Holy Spirit? Yes. It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit, wherewith we are sealed unto the day of redemption in the book of Ephesians. I think there's two places it talks about being sealed with the Holy Spirit. And I think everybody out there knows that whoever has the mark of the beast, whose spirit do they have? The devil, whoever has the seal of God, whose spirit do they have? God's spirit. So those things are obvious. So we're looking for something that is even deeper than that, that, that is going to be evident in the life. There's a distinguishing difference. The Sabbath commandment, longest of the Ten Commandments, in the middle of God's law, the only commandment that begins with the word remember, and it's the only commandment that, wait, I'm going to set this up. I shared with you a while ago, on the planet you've got the Holy Land, and in the Holy Land you've got the Holy City, Jerusalem, Israel is the Holy Land, and in the Holy City you've got the Holy Mountain, Mount Zion, on which you have the Holy Temple, and in the Holy Temple there's the Holy Place, and beside the Holy Place you've got the Inner Sanctum, the Holy of Holies, and in the Holy of Holies you've got the Holy Ark, and in the Holy Ark you've got the Holy Law, are you beginning to get the picture? In the Holy Law, you have the word holy one time. It's in the middle of the law, and it is in the Sabbath commandment. It says you're to keep it holy. And why is this such a big deal? You're alive right now, and you're alive because of time. If you have no time, you don't live. We exist in time. 
God created a day of time to worship him and to dedicate to him. Some people, it's easier for them to give a donation at church than to give God their time. And God is saying, if you love me, then show me. Dedicate time to me. If someone always says to a person, oh, I love you, I love you, and they spend no time with them, you begin to wonder, do they love them? If you love someone, you're going to want to spend time with them. God says, this is a sign of that love. And this is the seal of God in the law of God. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. It's in the Sabbath commandment. And God says this several times through the scriptures, and we'll look at a few of these. We identified, question four, we identified the beast in lesson 13. What is its mark of authority? All right, we talked about the seal of God. Now, remember what we said about the beast. And I, I hope you get your seatbelt on, friends. I'm just going to read you a couple of uh, quotes that identify the church, see if I can quietly do this. The church um, went through a time of great apostasy. Paul said that that would happen. There'd be a falling away from the scriptures. The Protestant reformers believed that this first beast in Revelation 13 was the Roman Catholic Church. And it includes some of the Orthodox churches also in Eastern Europe as well. But... Um, let me just give you an example of some things where there's been a drift from the scriptures. And this is not something I dreamed up. This is what the Protestant position has been. Do we go by the Bible, sola scriptura, or do we go by tradition? The Bible teaches that we're not to bow down to statues. It's one of the Ten Commandments. But the Roman Catholic Church says that you can and should bow down to statues. The Bible teaches that all have sinned except Jesus. Catholic Churches teaches that Mary was sinless. The Bible says that Jesus is the only mediator between man and God. The Roman church says that Mary is a co-mediator with Christ, not to mention some of the saints that they pray to. The Bible teaches that Christ is offered his sacrifice on the cross once and for all. Catholic church teaches that the priest sacrifices Christ on the altar at mass. This is a big debate in the Reformation about transubstantiation. The Bible teaches that all Christians are saints and priests. The Roman Catholic Church says that the saints and priests are a special caste within the Christian community. The Bible teaches that all Christians should know that they have eternal life, 1 John 5, 13. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that all Christians cannot and should not know that they have eternal life. The Bible teaches that we should call no religious leader father. Jesus said that in Matthew 23. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that we may call priests the Pope or the Father. The Bible teaches not to pray in vain repetition, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 7. The Catholic Church teaches people to say the Lord's Prayer or Hail Mary in a repetitive form. The Bible teaches to confess your sins to God because only God can forgive sin. Isaiah 43, Luke 5, 24. The Roman Catholic Church says you must confess your sins to the priest for forgiveness. The teachings of purgatory, limbo, Prayers for the dead are nowhere found in the scriptures, but they're relics of paganism. So this is just some high points. The church, and I want to reiterate what I said. If you didn't hear it this morning, there are going to be a whole lot of Roman Catholic people in heaven. And uh, church membership by itself is not what saves a person. And there are a lot of godly, dedicated people in many different Christian persuasions. I want to make that very clear. But there's only one Bible. There's only one truth. The Bible says the truth will set you free. So every divergence from the truth enslaves people in part or in whole. So we need to know what the Bible teaches on this. So we identified what the beast was in our presentation this morning. Now let's find out what they claim is their mark of authority. And these are from their writings. Now if I used to go to Catholic school and I never was confirmed as a Catholic. I just went because they had good education. And if you go to a Catholic church and you want to get catechized, they take you through the catechism. And that's a question-answer format, good teaching method. We use it here. Jesus used it. And this is from their catechism when they answer questions about their faith. All right, first of all, question, which day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Hmm, why do they go Sunday? Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. 
Have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. It's technically not all. We don't. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. They freely admit that. They actually say this is a mark of our ecclesiastical power. What is the second beast of Revelation 13 force? Now, we already told you, first beast in Revelation 13, we believe, is the Roman Catholic Church. We believe it meets all the criteria. We went through about 11 or 12 different points this morning. And then we said the second beast, we believe, is talking about the United States, which used to be a, a, a beachhead of Protestants for the world. And, uh, but it's been going through a real change. America used to subsidize and send out missionaries all over the planet, but gradually America is becoming less and less of a Christian nation. And it tells us that something is going to happen. Starts out like a lamb, ends up speaking like a dragon. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, does anyone have the mark of the beast now? No. And I know we'll get some questions on this. What, what's the transition point? When does someone actually receive the mark of the beast? When there is a law that compels them to worship a certain way or their penalties if they don't. If we choose to obey the laws of a religious power instead of the laws of God, well, Peter said, should you obey God or man? He said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Now, follow me for a moment, friends. For me, it's so clear. I hope I can make it clear for you. You go to Daniel chapter, um, go to Daniel chapter 3. The government makes a religious law that everybody needs to break the second commandment about idolatry. They don't, if they don't bow down and worship that golden image, they're going to die. But God's people say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cannot do it because we would rather obey God. And so they're persecuted. The death penalty. They go to the fiery furnace, but Jesus delivers them. Daniel chapter 6, Medo-Persian king makes a law that everybody must break the first commandment. Worship only him as king for 30 days. Notice the devil sneaky. Don't do it forever, just 30 days. Just break God's command for a little while so you can get along with everybody. Daniel will not do it. He goes to the lion's den. God delivers him. You look in the book of Esther. Mordecai will not bow down to Haman. Haman gets the Persian king to make a law that all the Jews should be annihilated, death decree, on a certain date. But God stands up for his people, and they survive. The Bible is telling us in the last days there is going to be a combination of a political, religious power. Two powers are going to unite. You can have the, the religion of the East and the West and the politics of the East and the West, and they're going to unite, and they're going to compel people to worship a certain way. And probably the point this time is not going to be the first commandment or the second commandment. It's going to be the fourth commandment. This is what we're sharing here, and I hope we can make a good case for it. But no one has it yet because it's not compelled yet. Revelation 13, 12, and he causes the earth and them that dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We discovered that in 1798, the Roman church received a deadly wound, but once again, they've become a worldwide power. You know what an image to the beast is? What's an image? It's a facsimile. It's a similarity. And isn't it interesting? I always thought that if you go to the headquarters of the Vatican, you look at the capital, uh, they both got that kind of Romanesque design. And in front of the Vatican, you've got a big sundial. And in front of the capital, you've got the biggest sundial in the world. It's the Washington Monument. And there are several things that are very interesting. I've got more on this later, so keep coming. Is the mark of the beast uh, or the seal of God, a visible mark. Now, a lot of people think, don't worry, no one's going to give me the mark of the beast because uh, as soon as they pull out that tattoo gun and try and tattoo 666 on my forehead, I'm going to run. And folks figure, as long as I don't let anybody tattoo 666 in my hand or my forehead, I'm okay. But as time's gone by, folks realize that's probably not very likely. I mean, who would get in line if the government said, everybody line up so we can tattoo 666 on your forehead? It's not what it's talking about. And yet, uh, even some bad Bible paraphrases, some people have created their own Bible paraphrase when it talks about the mark of the beast, it says a tattoo in the right hand or the forehead. 
That's unfortunate. That's not what it's talking about. The mark of Cain doesn't say God put a tattoo on him. We're not exactly sure what that was. But if we let the Bible explain itself, it becomes very clear. Let's look here in, um, oh, the other thing I've heard is, you know, recently now they've started improving the RFID technology and a growing number of companies, they got some in Europe and Scandinavia, they're tech companies, they put this little rice-sized RFID thing uh, between the thumb and the forefinger and you don't feel it. And um, they don't have to carry a card with them anymore. Nobody can steal their card. They walk to work, they swipe their hand, it opens the door. We got cards here to open the door in our office. They swipe their hand, it checks them in, their hours, they leave the building, they swipe out, they know who it is, when they came, and uh, it's becoming very convenient. And they're doing it now for medical devices. They've been doing it for dogs for a while, at least in North America. You have your dog registered, they put a chip in it in case it runs away, they scan your dog and they find the owner. There's a lot of good arguments for this. But that is not the mark of the beast. But it is creepy either way. So, what is it? Hebrews 10, verse 16. Saith the Lord, I will put, talking about the new covenant, I will put my law in their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Is that literally God opening up the chest and putting the law inside or is it talking about symbolically? It's talking about putting the law of God in our, our hearts and our minds and our hands. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might. It's a figure of speech. If you say someone, can you please lend me a hand? They don't toss you their hand. It means can you give me some action, some work. Isaiah 59, 6, the works, their works are works of iniquity and the act of violence is in their hands. Again, the hand is talking about action. And so it's a sign for thee, Exodus 13, 9. On thy hand and a memorial between thine eyes. God's seal, God's law in the forehead. It says, I'll put my laws in their minds and I'll write them in their hearts. Now let me, let me read, uh, well I can quote it to you, Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6. And it tells us there, these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. You'll teach them diligently to your children when you lay down, when you rise up, when you go in, when you come out. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they will be frontlets between your eyes. See, that's very simple, friends. If you do not have the law of God written in your forehead or in your hand, let me give you some more verses. I, you know, a lot of people m get mixed up on this, but there's so many verses on it. Look in Exodus chapter 13, verse 9. And it shall be a sign for you on your hand and a memorial between your eyes. Now, in Hebrew, between the eyes meant forehead. In the Greek New Testament, it says forehead. People are not making the connection. It's the same language in the hand, in the forehead. The law of God should be in our actions and it should be in our worship in the two. Let me take you to verse 16, Exodus 13, 16. It shall be a sign for you in your hand as frontlets between your eyes. By strength of the hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Matter of fact, I think there's four times there in the writings of Moses, it says in the hand, in the forehead, in the hand, in the forehead. None of those times is it literally some people have taken it that way. That's why some of my Jewish uh, Orthodox friends, they actually take pieces of the law and they tie it on their hand. They hang it from their phylacteries in the, uh, between their forehead. And they'll literally staple pieces of the law of God on the door. And that's a beautiful ceremony, but what does God want? Does he want it on your forehead or in your forehead? Does he want the law of God on your hand or in your actions? And this is really what it's talking about. So it's going to be a battle about who we obey. Will we obey the laws of the beast or are we going to obey the laws of God? That determines, and you'll have to have the spirit of God to obey the law of God, that determines what's the difference between the mark of the beast and the seal of God. It's God says, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Question eight. The beast has a mark to represent its power and authority. Does God also have a sign of his power? You can read in Ezekiel 20, verse 12, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies them. It's a sign that God sanctifies us. Do we still need sanctification? Yes. And that sign is still there. Hallow my Sabbaths. It'll be a sign between you and me that you might know that I am the Lord your God and you know, the truth be known. Much of Christianity, North America and around the world, they don't even keep Sunday as the Sabbath anymore. I 
used to preach in Baptist churches on Sunday, and I remember people meeting me before the service. They said, Pastor, you better be done by noon because the football game starts. And so the idea of people really keeping Sunday as a holy day, I remember years ago, some of my Christian friends say, you know, we grew up Baptist, Methodist, and there was no television in the home. We only wore certain clothes. We were not allowed to go out and play. Sunday was a special day. Americans aren't really keeping any day holy anymore. And so we've drifted away from what God's original plan was. Verily my Sabbath you will keep for it as a sign. There you got it again, a sign, symbol. Between me and you throughout your generations that you might know that I am the Lord that sanctifies you. So we've seen the Sabbath is a sign that he sanctifies us and he made the day holy. He can make us holy. It's a sign that he created the world for in six days the Lord created. Do we still need God to create us? Or recreate us. We do. We still need the Sabbath as well. What did the Antichrist power attempt to change? It says in Daniel 7.25, he will think to change times and laws. Okay, I'll ask our studio audience. When you look at the Ten Commandments, which one of the Ten Commandments is both a law and a time? Just the Sabbath. There's only one. So that ought to narrow it down pretty quick. It says the beast power would act like he's got this authority now this is from the catholic church's own writings and uh, i'm not real good at latin it's the scredel de translat episcopat the pope has power to change times to abrogate laws and to dispense with all things even the precepts of christ now think about that they say the pope has the power to even dispense with the teachings of christ you know anyone can believe what they want in the way i understand freedom I think Jesus respects people's freedom. When Christ invited people to follow him, if they said no and they walked away, he didn't wrestle them to the ground and beat them up. When the disciples were upset because a town did not welcome Jesus, they wanted to call fire down. Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Let people have freedom. Uh, and I respect the freedom for people to believe whatever they want, but I respectfully disagree. I do not think the Pope has the authority, biblically, to change the teachings of Christ. And I don't know if people are all aware of what the official teachings are. They admit, and this is an 1895 letter from uh, C.F. Thomas, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. Notice this. And the act of changing the Sabbath is a mark. There's that word mark, interesting. The act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Now, I've got a lot of statements that say pretty much the same thing. Here's a more recent quote. This is from St. Catherine's a Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21st, 1995. Perhaps the boldest, most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. I actually think it was later. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Notice, not from any direction noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of her own power. People who think the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. And I'd like to thank them for that endorsement. But that's actually true. They, if you're going to go by the Bible, it sort of narrows it down. You know, I've just got, you can just go online and you can look at the quotes from different religious leaders. I can't read them all. I've got pages and pages of quotes from honest theologians that will admit this. Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Church of Christ, uh, Presbyterian. Here's an Anglican. And this is from Isaac Williams in his sermon on the catechism. We're told in the scripture that we're to keep the first day. Are, are we at all? No, we're commanded to keep the seventh. But we are nowhere commanded to keep the first day. The reason why we keep the first day holy instead of the seventh is the same reason we observe many other things, not because the Bible, but because the church has enjoined it. In the Baptist manual, written by uh, Edward Hiscox, Dr. Edward T. Hiscock, we believe that the law of God is the eternal imperishable rule of his moral government. There was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, but the Sabbath day was not Sunday. It'll be said, and with some show of triumph, that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week. Where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament, absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence for the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. And I'll go on here. I'm just skipping to save some time. 
Of course, I quite well know Sunday did come into use early in Christian history as a religious day as we learn it from Christian fathers and other sources. But what a pity it comes branded with the mark of paganism, christened with the name of the sun god, when we adopted and sanctioned the papal apostasy and it was bequeathed as a sacred legacy, legacy to Protestantism. They admit it. Church of Christ. This is Alexander Campbell, I think the founder of the Church of Christ. I do not believe the Lord's Day came in the room or place of the Jewish Sabbath or that the Sabbath was changed from the seventh to the first day for this plain reason. Where, is, where there is no testimony, there can be no faith. Now there is no testimony in all of the oracles that the Sabbath was changed or that the Lord's Day came in room or place of it. Um, I've just got to pick through a few here. Here's Sermon John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. This handwriting of ordinances our Lord did blot out and take away, talking about the ceremonial laws and nailed to his cross. But the moral law contained in the Ten Commandments and enforced by the prophets, he did not take away the moral law. It stands on entirely a different foundation from the ceremonial or ritual law. Every part of this law must remain in force upon all mankind in all ages. Dwight Moody wrote in his book, Weight and Bounce, the Sabbath was binding in Eden, and it has been in force ever since. The fourth commandment begins with the word remember, showing that the Sabbath already existed when God wrote the law on the tables of stone at Sinai. How can mere men claim that this one commandment has been done away with when they'll admit the other nine are still binding? You know, I might pause there and just mention that. <clears throat> I've had the privilege, and again, I want to reiterate, I know there are good Christians in many different churches uh, preaching in Baptist churches, Methodist church, Church of Christ, Pentecostal, Foursquare, Nazarene. I I've, I've, know there's lovely Christian people in these churches, and I know I can go to virtually all of these churches and I can preach on any of the commandments. I can preach, honor your father and mother, and they'll say amen. I can preach, don't steal, and they'll say amen. I can say, you should only serve the God, only, and they'll say amen. Should not commit adultery. They'll get a little nervous, but they'll say amen. I go through all the commandments and they'll agree and then I'll say, and remember the Sabbath day and they say, we're not under the law. It's been changed. And people, I just, it's amazing to me how nervous people get because it boils down to doing something that's different from what they've heard. It's hard to change and it means their time. And people, it, there is a sacrifice when you learn the truth and, uh, but the blessings outweigh the sacrifice. The Bible says he blessed the day. He did not curse it. He wants it to be a blessing. Peter answered the other, with the other apostles and they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, just to give you an example of how the Catholic Church has drifted from the scriptures, I thought I'd throw this in. Washington Post, October 28, 2014. Pope Francis says, evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation. Because evolution requires the creation of beings that evolve. So I guess he's agreeing that, you know, if a being evolved into a man, did they think that being was an amoeba? Which being evolved into a man? But they, they accept, they embrace that uh, you don't take Genesis literally, that we've evolved. This is from the Catholic Encyclopedia, 1991. We should not interpret Genesis literally. So the stories about Noah and the ark and Adam and Eve and the creation and marriage and Abraham and the Tower of Babel, they say these are all fables. Don't take it literally. Well, friends, that's where I say, you know, there's just got to be a party in the way. If you're going to be a Bible Christian, if the Bible is a source of truth, then how can we scuttle and jettison all of the Bible truth and say, well, we'll just find out what the culture believes. That's very dangerous. Question 10. What was God's criticism of his ancient priests or pastors? Malachi 2, verse 8 and 9 says, You've caused many to stumble at the law. You've not kept my ways, but you've been partial in the law. So they said, well, we'll keep some of the law, but we're partial about it. And he told the priests, you're causing them to stumble. You know what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29 Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would keep all of my commandments always that it might be well with them and their children forever. God's not offering us a 10% discount. 
God doesn't call them the 10 suggestions or the 10 recommendations. This is God. He writes it in stone with his finger. You can't, man can't change the law of God. And he wants us to keep it. Amen. And whenever we disobey any law of God, we're going to suffer in some capacity. God said, they have forgotten the law of thy God. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for knowledge. What kind of knowledge? How are they being destroyed for not knowing? He says, because you've rejected knowledge, I'll also reject thee. Because you've forgotten the law of your God. Hosea 8, 12. I've written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. And I'm amazed sometimes. I'll preach this and, and I'll even have pastors say, oh, pastor, they get very nervous about the law. I said, is it in the Bible? Are you a Bible preacher? Isn't this important? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. God is telling us that he wants us to keep his law so that it, we can have that blessing. It's not to be a burden, including the Sabbath commandment. And yet a lot of the world, they're putting blinders on. Many of the world, they don't look at the commandment about idolatry. And it's interesting a lot of people bow down to statues and you say, you know, doesn't the Bible say you're not supposed to do that? Are you aware that the um, Catholic Church has rearranged the Ten Commandments? The, Cap the Catholic Church in the regular Jewish tradition, Protestant tradition, the Fourth Commandment is the Sabbath. The Catholic Church has taken the part of the Ten Commandments that deal with idolatry and they sort of merge that with the First Commandment. And so it just says, don't have other gods before me. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. Third commandment, remember the Sabbath day. And you say, well, how do they end up with 10? They divide the 10th commandment in two. Don't covet your neighbor's house and don't covet your neighbor's uh, wife and his house and things. And uh, they're trying to get around that idolatry one. And if you ask them about idolatry, they'll say, well, when we bow before Mary or one of the other saints, we know it's not really them. But that's what any Buddhist around the world would say. When they're bowing before a Buddha, you say, you know, that's not Buddha. Oh, no, we know it's not Buddha. But it helps us to visualize Buddha. Oh, but it's idolatry because it lowers your conception of God when you do that. He says, do not do it. And one of the principal things we're learning as we study the subject of Revelation, this beast power is making an image. The Bible is so clear. Do not get involved in idolatry. John says, my little children, keep yourself from idols. The king of Babylon, he dreamed of this big idol, but it was all crushed, and the rock of God's word fills the whole earth. By the way, how does Daniel bring down, I'm sorry, how does David bring down Goliath? What does he use? I'll ask a couple of kids we have here. What is it? A stone. Where's the stone hit Goliath? Ah, they get the mark of the beast in the forehead. <laughs> That's how they bring him down, the word of God. What specific solemn rebuke does God give to religious leaders regarding his holy Sabbath? Thou hast despised my holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths. Her priests have violated my laws and have profaned my holy things. They put no difference between the holy and the profane. This is not just in the Catholic Church, but in many religious institutions, they've taken what God has called to be holy and they've made it common. You know, the Bible tells us that the purpose of the plan of salvation is not to just make us happy. It's first and foremost to make us holy. And it's not until we're holy we will be happy. The Bible tells us without holiness no man will see the Lord. And if he's got a commandment that he says we should keep holy, then we ought to realize it's important to God. It's a day he blessed. It's called the Lord's Day. It's not the Sabbath of the Jews. He calls it the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In Isaiah 58, he calls it my holy day. And they've hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. How can it be more clear? I mean, boy, that just underscores what's happening in many Christian churches today. They've hid their eyes from my Sabbaths. And our prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar. This is Ezekiel 22, verse 28. It's another passage. How? It's talking about making a wall and forgetting to put in the concrete or the mortar. And uh, how do they do that? Seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, thus says the Lord when the Lord has not spoken, and telling people that they can ignore the Sabbath commandment. What specific sin does God command his leaders to denounce? Cry aloud, 
Lift up your voice. It says, spare not, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression. Now, I know preaching this message, sometimes I've made some enemies. I, I've got friends that are leaders in Christian churches all around the country. I can name their names. And some of them are friends. Some of them, when they see me, they won't even shake my hand. Uh, they know me. They've seen our programs. It's created some problems in their churches. And I'm sorry for that, but I cannot hide the truth. And, uh, and then I've got friends in other churches. And they say, Doug, I disagree with you, but I respect that you are boldly standing up for what you believe. You know, the bottom line is, I'm like everyone else. You know, I'd like to be liked. Uh, I would prefer people like me than dislike me. But ultimately, in the judgment, I've got to answer to God. And I don't want the Lord to be displeased with me. John the Baptist, Jesus said, was one of the greatest prophets because he was not ashamed to tell it like it is. He called the religious leaders in his day. He said, you are a brood of vipers. Who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Because you are you're teaching lies to the people. He said to King Herod, it is against the law of God for you to have your brother's wife. Well, that takes a lot of audacity and courage for him to say that. It cost him his head, ultimately. But you know what Jesus said? He was the greatest of the prophets because he had that courage, that boldness, like Elijah, to say, how long will we halt between two opinions? If Baal is God, then serve Baal. If God is God, then follow the word of God. Amen? And so... It's not going to make you popular, but God wants this message. It's like a loud voice that's supposed to go out in the world in the last days. Isaiah 58, verse 1, 13 and 14. If you turn away your foot, here's a message that is to be going. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight. It's not a burden, it's a delight. The holy of the Lord, not holy of the Jews, and, we'll, and it's honorable. Then, what will happen if we do that? Then you will delight yourself in the Lord, and I'll cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. I'm just finishing out the verse because I had memorized that particular one. These are the three angels' messages that are to go to the world just before Jesus comes, calling people to return to the word of God. Babylon is fallen. Come out of her, my people, lest you partake of her sins and receive of her plagues. This is the message that's to go. The message that fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made, the creator, the heavens and the earth and the sea. That's an excerpt from the Sabbath commandment. There's a message to call people to... Right now what's happening is everybody in the world, through media like this, the internet, all over the world, we've got people watching this program and we're only one of many. And people are hearing and you're seeing a shaking in the world and you're going to see a lot more shaking going on pretty soon. And what's happening? And there's going to be natural disasters. I believe there'll be political problems. I think there's going to be some financial problems and distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring, Jesus said. People are going to start turning to religion from fear. Some are going to turn to the word of God. Some are going to turn to religious institutions and leaders. And people are going to begin to gravitate to one of two poles. The word of God or the traditions of men. Friends, I'm hoping that you are building on the rock. Jesus said, there's a storm coming. The wise man builds his house on the rock. What is the rock? He that hears these words of mine and does them. It's not just hearing the word of God. It's doing the word of God. But the foolish man, he hears my words, but he builds on the sand because he listens to popular opinions, popular preachers. And when the storm comes, you notice the storm comes to the wise man and the storm comes to the fool. Friends, a storm is coming. And we need to be building on the word of God. Amen. Number 14. When you decide to accept Jesus and to fully follow him, what happens? Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. Friends, the Lord wants you to have that rest. The Sabbath is all about that rest. Now, Every commandment of God, there is the letter of the law and there's the spirit of the law. Let me illustrate. The letter of the law says, do not murder. Thou shalt not kill. It's actually, do not murder. Jesus said the spirit of the law is, do not be angry with your brother without a cause or you're guilty of murder. The letter of the law says, do not bear false witness. 
In the spirit of the law, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be honest and transparent in your communications. Do not swear falsely. So it's not just an action, it's an attitude. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said, the spirit of the law is if you look on a woman, it would work both ways, if a woman looks on a man, to lust in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. That's the spirit of the law. The letter of the law says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you'll labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord God. The spirit of the law is we come to Jesus and we find rest. We rest in the Lord. So when we keep the spirit of the law, will we also keep the letter? Sure. If a person says, I'm keeping the spirit of the law, I'm not thinking murderous thoughts. Yeah, I'm killing people. I'm breaking the letter, but I'm just keeping the spirit of it. No, you can't do that. If you're keeping the spirit, you're going to keep the letter. So a lot of people say, I don't need the Sabbath anymore because I've got the spirit of the law. I've got rest in Jesus. Well, you're lying. The Bible says, if any man says, I know him and keeps not his commandments, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. If you really are resting in Jesus, if he is your Lord, then the law that he gave us, people say, oh, that's the old, that's Moses' law. I keep Jesus' law. Oh, no, it's not Moses' law. Jesus made the Ten Commandments. All things that were made were made by him. He was up there on the mountain with his own finger writing those laws down. If you say you love him, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's one thing to say, Lord, Lord. He said, don't say Lord, Lord. Not everyone that says Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom, but he that does the will of my Father in heaven. Christ said in that day, many will come and they'll say, Lord, Lord. Went to church, cast out devils, did a lot of wonderful works. He'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You know what that word is? Lawlessness. A lot of people, they're living lawless lives. Jesus said that the way we show our love for him is by keeping his commandments. He wants you to have that rest and that peace that comes only from surrendering and doing his will. What is his will? Yea, I love to do thy will. Psalm 40, verse 8. Thy law is within my heart. That's the new covenant. The law in the heart, and it's not 90% of the law. It's 100%. It means you're surrendering to Jesus and his will. You can read in Revelation 15, verse 2, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on that sea of glass having harps of God. Friends, the Lord wants you to have that experience of being on that sea, being, having the victory over the beast and his image. There is going to be a very powerful, very convincing religious coalition in the last days. Satan is going to empower it, maybe even with his own impersonation of Christ, and there'll be signs and wonders and miracles. Most of the world is going to be deceived. But I think that God has you tuning into this program because he does not want you to be deceived. You don't have to be if you go by a thus saith the Lord. And before we close this part of our program, we want to have a special prayer with you and ask this question. Before you can say no to the mark of the beast, you need to say yes to the seal of God. Jesus wants to give you that rest. He's waiting for your answer. He's knocking on the door of your heart. You know, Christ is coming soon. There's only two groups, the saved and the lost. And I understand that um, police and rescue agencies have helicopters that are equipped with infrared technology. And if a child gets lost out in a blizzard or in the woods, they can fly over. And if that child's alive, they'll see their heat signature uh, with this equipment. And, you know, if you have the Holy Spirit in you when Jesus comes, he's going to know the ones who have his seal, who have his spirit, who are surrendered to him and obeying him. And we need to make that decision now if we want to be ready when he comes. No man knows the day or the hour. You don't know if he might come for you in 24 hours. If you die, your next thought is the resurrection. Don't hesitate, friends. If God spoke to your heart, I pray you'll make a decision now and say, Lord, I surrender. I don't want to be a hearer. I want to be a doer of the word. I'd like to pray with you. Father in heaven, Lord, we believe that Jesus is coming soon. We see, and the world is coming apart at the seams. We can see that society globally is becoming polarized, and we want to make sure that we are moving towards you and surrender to your, your will, that we surrender our hearts to Jesus, accept him as our Savior. Thank you for the sacrifice you made for our sins. Lord, I pray that you'll be with each person watching and listening now. Your spirit will move into their hearts and they'll make a full commitment to be willing to do your will. 
If they're not sure how they're going to do it tomorrow, I pray they'll make a decision right now to take the first step by faith, trusting that you'll continue to lead them, invite you to be the Lord of their hearts. So please, Lord, I, I pray that they'll choose that now. And I pray you continue to bless these programs. We've got a lot of important information still. And keep them coming, Lord, and that their lives might be transformed for the better. We thank you and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now don't go away, friends. We're going to have Bible questions in a moment. And keep in mind, what you've heard just now is really only part two in a four-part presentation. Keep listening and coming this week. Have you ever worried that you don't have enough time in your days or you can add another day to your life? Well, perhaps there is a way for you to add a whole other day to your existence. Watch how easy it is. I just stepped into yesterday. No, I'm not talking about going back to the future or back in history. I happen to be standing here in Tavayuni, Fiji, one of the only places in the world where the International Meridian Dateline runs through a piece of land. People have not always been able to play with time this way. Back in 1878, Sir Sanford Fleming, a Canadian, he recommended to the science community of the world that the globe be divided in 24 even segments, each separated by 15 degrees of longitude that would establish the international time system. In 1884, there was a prime meridian conference held in Washington, D.C. to standardize time and select the point for the prime meridian which would be zero degrees on the globe, it ended up being Greenwich, England. But that's not where we are. We are on the polar opposite side of the planet right now, but we're gonna step into the future. You wanna come? And look at that. The Lord is still with us, even here. He'll continue to take care of you, friends, wherever you go. Friends, you sometimes worry about the future. What will you eat? Will you have a home? Are you going to still have your job? Uh, what will you wear? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34, don't take thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought for the things of itself. He tells us that he feeds the birds and he clothes the flowers. He'll take care of us. We know that God will watch over us. He forgives the past. He promises to be with us in the present and he will continue to lead us in the future. But you've just got to give yourself to him. I invite you to do that right now. Hello, friends. We'd like to welcome you back to Revelation Now, and it's time for your Bible questions. We want to thank you for all of the great questions that have been sent in. Very important topic that we uh, looked at this evening, and you'll find out that a number of the questions are related to the study that we did in Revelation. Uh, Pastor Doug, before we get to the questions that folks have sent in, we have some questions we'll put up on the screen. Kay. So if you're ready, we'll take our first question. It says, do people who are worshiping on Sunday as a holy day have the mark of the beast now? No. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, dear Christian people that have maybe worshipped on the wrong day that are going to be in heaven. And the Bible tells us that sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. And there's no law right now that's compelling worship. And so it doesn't really become the mark of the beast issue until there's this uh, movement to compel it. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean it's not sin. If a person knows what the truth is, not just in the area of the Sabbath, but if a person knows the truth in any area of their life and they're, in, and they're rebelling against it or ignoring it, that's a dangerous uh, direction. So when we know God's will, we want to do God's will. Absolutely. All right, the next question that we have, it's uh, does God count people guilty for disobeying the Bible truth that has never been made clear to them? Yeah, this is actually similar to what I was just saying, but um, let me give you another example. I expect to see King David in heaven. Uh, David had uh, at least a dozen wives. Um, he didn't know. At the time of the ignorance, God winked at. If I took extra wives, uh, I'm not going to make it to heaven because I know. Matter <laughs> of fact, my lake of fire would begin in this life for me. <laughs> so, and, and you know, that's the way, it's that way with many different areas of truth. You know, there were, there were times when um, in, in the Old Testament times, you know, God basically, he judges people according to what they knew and there was a certain amount of ignorance and they practiced polygamy and slavery and things that uh, 
you know, God never wanted. And Jesus said, even divorce. He said, God, our Moses gave you a law regarding divorce because of the hardness of your hearts. But Christ came and he raised the standard. So we know better. See, so the standard's higher now when we know truth. Christ said to the uh, religious leaders, he said, if you did not know, you would have no sin. But now that you see, your sin remains. I think that's John chapter 9 when he healed the blind man. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you know makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of the verse where Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Yeah. So sometimes people might think, well, Pastor Doug, don't, don't tell me anything more. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible, but we need to realize that truth is a liberating thing. It sets us yeah. free. There's a peace, there's a joy, knowing that we are doing those things pleasing to God. I, I had a person come to some meetings like this that I did, and he said, I wish I never came. <laughs> he said, because now I know too much. And I said, well, I'll pray you're miserable until you surrender, then you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't want a person to be comfortable uh, in their slavery. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you want people to be saved. We have another question we'll put up on the screen. It says, shouldn't we worship God every day of the week? Absolutely. And we should worship God, you know, in our lives many hours through the day, every day. Sabbath commandment is not just about worship. It's about, uh, he says, keeping it as a holy day. Now, I know some people say, well, Pastor Doug, you keep the seventh day Sabbath. You keep one day a week. I worship God seven days a week. And I say, well, if you're keeping the Sabbath seven days a week, you're not holy, you're lazy. <laughs> uh, God tells us that uh, the Sabbath is a day to lay aside from our regular secular employment, to worship God. And, but it's not, you know, you can worship God every morning. I have family worship or I, we worship on our knees. Karen and I knelt and prayed together tonight. So you can worship God seven days a week. But um, keeping the Sabbath is different. It's special time. It's quality worship time you're coming together bible says it's a holy convocation mm -hmm. that means a time of holy convening assembly where we congregate and we worship god uh, hebrews new testament tells us in chapter 10 forsake not the assembling of yourselves together and all the more as you see the day approaching and i know it's tough right now people say oh there's covid and so you got to be careful as you assemble but um, i think there's something that should be said about when people of god come together and worship and Sabbath is part of that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, well, we're going to take a look at some <coughs> of the questions. So the first one that we have is, um, what are the ten diadems or crowns on the heads of the beast? I think it's referring to the first beast of Revelation 13. Yes, th these are the ten divisions, and they're not only the ten, uh, the ten crowns that are on the, uh, the uh, horns, but you can look at Daniel chapter 2, and it tells us that that image has got ten toes. So it's the same thing. It's talking about the 10 divisions of the Roman Empire. And I think we gave them to you. It was, well, the old names were the Heruli, Vandals, Ostrogoths. Those three were kind of later destroyed. You've got the, uh, the Franks, the Anglo-Saxons, the Alamanni, the Suevi, the, um, the Lombards, the, the Spanish. And those are some of the more modern names, the Italians, the Spanish, mm -hmm. the Germans, the English. And so it's the 10 divisions. Now those nations have kind of shifted and carved. It's always been about 10 that were in Western Europe there. That's where the, the, it's the financial juggernaut of the European Union is in those nations, the very 10 kingdoms. They had kings for a while. Mm -hmm. And now they've uh, you know, turned largely into democracies because of the influence. Interesting, you had the, uh, the French Revolution and then the American Revolution and they all kind of they got rid of their monarchies. England still has one, but it's pretty much a, what do you call it? A, it's a position that doesn't have any clout with it. Mm -hmm. There's a word for that I can't think of right now. Well, you know, what's also interesting, Pat, that the first piece of Revelation 13 talks about having these crowns upon its horns. Yeah. But you get to the second beast in Revelation 13, the lamb-like beast that has two horns, but there's no crowns. Yeah. Now, I think we're going to be talking about that second beast coming up in a later presentation. Cause well, yeah, I don't mind you sharing it now because I think uh, re repetition sometimes is helpful. Mm -hmm. So those two horns represents, well, that lamb-like beast that comes up from the earth is the United States of Bible prophecy. And I think you'll be mm -hmm. getting into the details there. Uh, there's no crowns on the horns. So this new power that came up around 1798, shortly before, um, doesn't have a monarchy. So yeah. it's a unique form of government, new, at least at that time, in the world. And of course, there's a number of other identifying marks yeah. of the second beast, the lamb-like beast, or the U.S. So, the, yeah, the two horns would then be that it's got a church, or it's got religion 
civil. without a pope, and it's got a government without a king. Right. So freedom of religion, freedom of government. It's just very unique when that happened, and that's one, one reason the country exploded, so it's you know, a world power today. Yep. All right. Next question that we have is, um, does China appear in the prophecies of Revelation? Well, you know, that's a great question. And, um, you know, some people wonder where it says it, in Revelation, it says that uh, make way for the kings of the east. And they thought, well, maybe that's, you know, China and Korea and <laughs> these Asian kingdoms are going to come. I don't think that's what it's talking about. Um, I, I think that China is going to go through uh, a revolution eventually where Christianity is spreading even in spite of increased persecution mm. lately mm -hmm. in China. And I believe that China, eventually the people are going to say, we need religious freedom, and you're going to see the church just explode. And I think it's going to happen also in the Middle Eastern countries. Mm -hmm. A lot of people there are going to hear about Jesus, and it's happening actually now. Well, you know, Pastor Doug, the first angel's message says to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And even in these countries where Christianity is not legal, it's amazing through the Internet, through satellite television, people are still receiving the gospel. We get testimonies of people yeah. in countries where uh, their life could be on the line if they are found to be worshiping, you know, being a Christian or worshiping Christ, and yet they're still participating. Yeah. We even have people watching now that are in some places where Christianity is illegal. So it's exciting yeah, to see the gospel. And they write us, they've got sort of uh, anonymous names. Yeah. They say, you know, if anyone finds out, or if my family finds mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. they could be in big trouble. And so we want to pray. God, but the gospel's taking off. That's right. Uh, just by the way, side note, we have an amazing facts Chinese website, mm -hmm. and um, that is the most second or the second most viewed website that Amazing Facts has, next to the Amazing Facts English website. Then we have the Chinese website. So there's a lot of people that are tuning in yes. and watching these programs. So and we tell you what it was, but we can't speak the language. Yeah. <laughs> but if you type in Amazing Facts China, we also have Amazing Facts Indonesia. Correct. But if you type in Amazing Facts Indonesia, it'll take you to the Bahasa Indonesia site. I wonder if our Chinese site will do that. If you just Google Amazing Facts Chinese. Yeah. I'll it's a long word. I can't say. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, another question that we have. What time does the Bible refer to when it says the earth will deny its fruit? What verse are they referring to? Wh when the earth will deny its fruit. Talking about a drought during a time of uh, disaster. Well, we, you know, there's uh, several examples of that happening. Of course, the book of Joel talks about uh, a famine that comes because of this plague of locusts. Mm -hmm. And Jesus talks about that there's going to be pestilence in diverse places. And uh, there were uh, several famines that were foretold. There's even a famine during the New Testament times that hit Jerusalem, foretold by Agabus the prophet, and uh, later came in the time of Paul. So, you know... Um, Several times there were famines. I don't know uh, the verse that they're specifically talking about. I think they're about. Talking, to, talking about a time when the plagues begin to fall. And one of the plagues is water turning red like, like blood, right. beginning with the sea and then eventually going into fresh water. Well, that's going to affect irrigation. It talks about the sun with an intense heat, yeah. terrible drought. So, yes, during the seven last plagues, there will be a shortage oh, they're, of they're Okay, they're referring to the time of the plagues. Yeah, during yeah. the time of trouble. Yep. Storing food won't help you, though, if that's what you're thinking. Someone's going to come time. and steal it. So, yeah, you're, you're, God will miraculously feed his people during the Great Tribulation. I believe that. Did he miraculously feed Elijah during that three and a half years mm -hmm. in the wilderness? Did he miraculously feed the children of Israel going through the wilderness? I think he's going to miraculously provide. Where is it, Isaiah? It says their bread and their water will be sure. Right. He'll take care of us during that time. So don't worry about the, the famine that's caused by the plagues. Okay, another question that we have. Uh, <coughs> did Adam and Eve speak Hebrew? People tell me they spoke Spanish. <laughs> but those are usually <laughs> Spanish-speaking people that tell me that, that <laughs> romantic language. Uh, you know, they spoke the language of Canaan, and I suppose when we get to heaven, we'll find out more about what that is. What I'm going to find interesting, I'm always fascinated by languages. I've learned how to say hello or good evening, everybody, in lots of different languages because as I travel. And uh, I see, you see little words that are similar between languages, and I want to find out what the language of Canaan was or Eden and find out, were there any words in these world languages, what language was the most similar to the language that was spoken before the Tower of Babel? So uh, I don't know what that was now. But you know, probably all languages over time have changed, even English, yeah. the early English, can different barely than understand. what it is now. Yep. I can barely so understand you and you're South African. I know, African. yeah, we, we've got to <laughs> we have our challenges. <laughs> 
All right, another question that we have. Who are the two witnesses? I think we might have mentioned this before, but I think they're yes. asking in the context of end-time events. This is found, in it is a definitely a Revelation question. It's found in Revelation chapter 11. And some people think these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. And the reason they think that is because they end up doing many things like Moses and Elijah, and they figure, well, Moses and Elijah are in heaven. The Bible tells us they appeared to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets. Moses is the great lawgiver. Elijah was the greatest of the prophets. That's the word of God. I held up my iPad, but I got the Bible on here now. Uh, so you have the, the word of God, uh, last prophecy in the Old Testament. It says, remember the law of Moses, Malachi chapter 4. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet, the law and the prophets. That's talking about the word of God. Jesus expounded unto them when he rose from the dead from the law and the prophets. And so these two witnesses are the word of God. The word of God says these two witnesses have the power to shut up heaven. It says they get the power to call plagues upon men. Uh, and they're going to be attacked. This is describing a, a, an all-out attack on the word of God that happened with the birth of atheism mm. in Europe, principally in France. It says their bodies will lie in the street for three and a half days. For three and a half years, Bibles were outlawed. But at the end of the time, they were caught up to heaven. They began to print Bibles again and, and the word of God was exalted. And so uh, we've got a booklet on that they can we read do. for free. Yeah, if you'd like to go to the Amazing Facts website, you type in, ask for the book, The Two Witnesses, and we have a whole book dealing with that prophecy and the word of God. It's a mm -hmm. great study. All right, Pastor Doug, the next question that we have, um, in Matthew 24, verse 15, it says, when will this happen and when should we flee from the cities and I'll just read it Matthew okay. 24 15 it says therefore when you see the abomination of desolation <coughs> spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place whoever reads let him understand then let those who be in Judea flee to the mountains and let him who is on his housetop not go down to get anything out of his house okay Jesus is speaking about a dual prophecy here because the disciples ask him two questions one question he said, uh, he tells them there won't be one stone left upon another in Jerusalem in the temple. And then he also talked about the end. And so they said, when will these things be? The destruction of Jerusalem. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? He commingles his answer because the answers are similar. For the Jews, the Christians that were living in Jerusalem, when he said, when you see Jerusalem encompassed with armies. And now is that, I think that's the way it's worded in Luke. In Luke. Mm -hmm. So then let's, let those be in Judea, flee into the mountains. In the last days, it's not going to be pagan Rome surrounding Jerusalem. It's going to be papal Rome surrounding God's new Jerusalem, the bride, his church, with laws. And so it's going to be this religious movement, this coalition of religions, Protestantism and Catholicism and these Orthodox churches are going to come together and make religious laws. And if you do not keep those religious laws, won't be able to buy or sell, and ultimately there'll be a death decree. That'll be a signal for God's people to get out of Dodge, as they say, and because uh, there'll be a great time of trouble that will follow. Okay, the next question that we have is in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17. It talks about no man be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. So people are wondering, if the mark is not physical, how are they going to enforce buying and selling? Well, I think that the... Um, the beast power is going to use technology to enforce it. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. um, for one thing, isn't it interesting we talk about they cannot buy or sell unless they cooperate with this beast power. You know, the United Nations, which is in the United States, is foremost in, uh, in the U.S. In, econ in legislating economic sanctions. What's a sanction? Mm -hmm. Another country cannot buy or sell unless they cooperate. So they'll do it on an international level. They'll do it on an individual level. I remember once going to the bank and all of a sudden my credit card was frozen. And I thought, what happened? Well, I had to have a little talk with the IRS. IRS. It was a misunderstanding. But just like that, they locked up all of the finances. And I thought, wow, that is frightening. Yeah. And by the way, we pay our taxes. Everything was okay. It was a misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> and that was frightening. And I thought, how easy would it be now? This was years ago. How easy would it be now? With all the technology, I mean, every, I rarely use cash anymore. Almost well, you all know, Pastor, like even traveling internationally now, it's, it's easy. You just yeah. use a credit card. 
India, all these countries in the world. You swipe your credit card and you can buy stuff. And it yeah. seems like every little store now has access to a card machine. <laughs> where you and can yeah, use the, a credit card. the thing now is the euro and the American dollar. Euro based in Europe, and we've been saying this, and the American dollar based in the U.S., that's a currency accepted almost anywhere in the world right, right. now, right. and digital mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. And they're pushing now for a, what they call digital currency. It's coming up more and more. Okay. So it'll be easy to enforce that. So let's just suppose you do not sign on with these religious laws. You don't show up at this, uh, whatever they call this place of worship at the prescribed time. You don't swipe your card. Um, you don't bow down at the right time. Then it's going to register. And you go to buy something, it's like, cannot buy, cannot sell. And it's going to be pretty scary. Okay, we have another question. If you have no religion, are you serving Satan? Yeah, Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. And if you're not with Christ, there's only one other leader left. That's the devil. So um, if a person says, well, I just don't believe anything, well, you're rejecting your creator and his plan for your life. And the only other option, Christ said, if you're not with me, you are against me. So there's no Switzerland when it comes to the great controversy. No neutral territory. Right, yeah. you're on one side or the other. Yeah. All right, another question. Will the seven last plagues be literal? Yes. Um, and people say, well, but you know, so much of Revelation is spiritual. What makes you think it's literal? Well, because it, it's so vivid in its description and the fallout of that and the plagues that fell back in Bible times were very literal. And... Um, uh, it talks about the plagues that fall in Babylon. And if you read in Psalm 91, it talks about God's people being protected from the plagues that come in the last days. Jesus said there's going to be a great time of trouble. Why would we doubt that there's going to be these plagues? Mm -hmm. Now, there are s some um, symbolic applications to the plagues. Yeah. I'm thinking of the one where it Darkness talks about the drying the up of, of the river yeah. Euphrates, yeah. making way for the kings of the earth. But yeah, they're very real yeah. in their application. All right, another question that we have. It says, uh, are we expecting a falling away within Christian churches before the last days? It's already happened. Hmm. You know, when it tells us in uh, 2 Thessalonians, is that it, Pastor Ross? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that day will not come unless there comes a falling away mm -hmm. first. And Paul said, after my departure, it wasn't long after Paul's departure, in the second century, the churches began to compromise. And it just went from bad to worse until you got to 538, and pretty soon the church became a political organization that actually punished people who didn't believe. Jesus would never do that. Yeah, so the verse you're referring to there <coughs> is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. It yeah. talks about a falling away. So that falling away has already begun, but I think it's going um, to be pretty severe in the days ahead. We see even in North America that used to be a, um, a real beachhead of Christianity in the world. Um, like I said, there's a real drift from Christianity that's been happening. Mm -hmm. Now, still, the majority of people in the country claim Christianity, but it's gone from 90% to 80% to 70%. And so we can see that people are becoming more and more secular. Mm -hmm. All right, another question that we have is, what does it mean, Pastor Dick, to be unequally yoked? Well, a yoke was a an instrument where you would get the added strength of two or three or four animals that you could link up together with a harness and they would pull as you plow and the Bible says you don't yoke an oxen with a donkey. They walk different. Their gait is different. They'll chafe. They'll, they'll each get sore trying to compensate for the others. It's like rowing with one oar that's sh short and one that's long, and you're just going to go in circles. So for a person to be unequally yoked means a believer marrying an unbeliever. Or when a believer gets into a partnership business deal with an unbeliever, if your values and morals are different, you're going to end up having problems. And so uh, it says we should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, especially in something like a marriage covenant. And I know a lot of people say, well, I know that he or she doesn't believe, but they're so beautiful and they're so nice and they're so Christ-like. I'm going to study with them. I'll change them after we get married. And um, there may be occasions that works out, but so often the believer ends up being changed. Mm -hmm. And it causes all kinds of heartache and it's difficult for the children. So you want to marry someone that has the same values you have in the big issues of life like your religion would be number one issue. Okay, another question that we have. Is there anything wrong in going to church on Saturday and Sunday? Well, technically there's nothing wrong with going to church any day. Um, 
this is Saturday night right now, and we're having a religious program. We're going to have another one tomorrow night. We'll have one on uh, Tuesday night and Wednesday night. We have a prayer meeting at our church every Tuesday. I think we're moving it to Wednesday soon. Mm -hmm. but, so, you know, you can gather together to worship God. The Bible tells us the New Testament believers gathered uh, from house to house on all through the week. But that's separate from the formal gathering together of holy time and worship when everybody puts it aside and they all come together. Uh, I know when I first learned the Sabbath truth, all of my friends went to church on Sunday. And uh, so I went to church on Sunday, but I, I went to a Sabbath-keeping church on Saturday for a while until I kind of got to know people and made some new friends because I didn't want to lose all my friends. And, uh, you know, after a while, the Bible says it's hard to serve two masters. And you, you'll find that... It, it's going to become difficult because you're going to have one group that's going to start disagreeing with your theology and you'll usually run into friction and you'll end up giving one, you'll give up one faith or the other after a while. Mm -hmm. So people might do that for a while, but it's hard to maintain that. Okay. All right. Another question that we have, how could David in Psalms med meditate upon the law day and night? Was this literal? Well, it didn't mean all day and all night when David said that. He's saying that during the day and during the night, I meditate on your law. And the word law, and you're reading that in Psalm 119, I believe, the word law did not always mean the Ten Commandments. The word law was sometimes used for just the Word of God comprehensively or at least the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses. And I think we should meditate on the Word of God on an ongoing basis. And uh, store the word of God in our hearts that we might not sin. And we ought to have our kids memori memorizing the law, especially when they're young. Moses said, when you rise up, when you lie down, as you go out, as you come in, it will guide them later in their lives, the, the great principles of his word, not just the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. But every Christian kid ought to know the Ten Commandments by heart. I do. I hope, I hope every believer knows that. Okay. Well, I think that's it for all of our questions tonight. And again, we want to thank those who sent in their questions. We'll try and take more tomorrow evening. We have another program, uh, sort of part three, Pastor Doug, of this series. So we're getting into some yeah, The deep Bride Bible of truth. Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and people are always asking, how do you find it? I interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, I do ahead. that a lot. Will you forgive me? <laughs> <laughs> it's about the Bride of Christ. And uh, uh, we're gonna, everyone's always saying, how do you pick a church? How do you know? What church is the true church? And there's so many different churches and doesn't matter. And it's going to be a great study. And we're going to use Revelation to explain this subject. I know if you have, if you give us some homework. Revelation 12. You might want to read that chapter because I think you're going to be looking at some prophecies found in Revelation 12. So also I'd like to remind everyone about our free offer for today. It mm -hmm. is our study guide entitled The Mark of the Beast. If you'd like to receive this, all you need to do is text the word MARKED to the number 405. Four, four, you'll get a digital download. If you're outside of North America, again, we remind you to go to our website, revelationnow.com, and you can download the study guide, The Mark of the Beast, and uh, take time to read through it. All the Bible verses, Pastor Doug, that you mentioned this evening, they're all there in the study guide. So Absolutely. if somebody wants to share with somebody else, you want to make sure you get that study guide. All right, we saved the best for last, friends. Remember, if you're going to miss something, you should have missed what we had before. Got five more presentations. Sunday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Sabbath morning. God bless you. We hope you tune in. Tell your friends also.